About 10 years ago, I started working professionally with dogs. About the same time, I also started working with a professional to start to understand and deal with my anxiety. For those of you that don't experience it, it's different from person to person. For me, it's, uh, you know, some panic, ruminating, feeling just overall unsafe or uncomfortable and, you know, fast heart rate. Sometimes I say it's like having a fire hose in your head. If you can get a hold of it and point it in the direction you want, it can be pretty productive, but it's easy to lose your grip and then it's all over the place and it's kind of hard to get control of it again. <clears throat> but learning to deal with those and, 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 and push through it gave me a desire to reach out to people who might have similar issues and particularly people who in my mind might be dealing with them at, at a greater level than I was, um, like veterans. So I became very active in the local veteran community. And then the dogs that I started working with, it started out uh, with pet dogs and dog packs. And I, I kind of graduated to working with dogs who had been abused, uh, taken in cruelty cases, dog fighting cases. And a lot of what we deal with with those kinds of dogs is fear and anxiety. So I started seeing a lot of similarities between me and those dogs in the way that they apparently felt, in the way it was manifesting in them, and then in the way that um, we were coming up with solutions to deal with the problems. But I also started seeing parallels between the dogs that I was working with and the people that I was volunteering with. Hercules is a dog that was taken in a dog fighting bus from the sheriff's department. And when we evaluate the dogs, we kind of look to see how they are post experience. And of course, you know, we all have reactions to to things that, that scare us, maybe threats. We have fight, flight, and, and freeze. And when we evaluated him, he really just seemed to be lacking fight and flight and kind of stuck in freeze. So we worked with him to help him with his anxiety and his fear and to rebuild a, a, a trust with him. But when I worked with Hercules, I didn't just see a fighting dog or a victim of dog fighting. I saw an individual who became something that somebody else asked him to be, went and fought somebody else's fight, and then is called damaged or scarred or good for only one thing or beyond repair. But I think what I really got from working with dogs and with veterans is I felt like those were two groups that made a commitment to me without asking anything of me in return. It was unconditional. And by traveling these now converging paths, I came to an idea that I felt like I could share and maybe give back to both of them. The first dog that I needed to work with was my first dog, Peanut. In her younger years, she had an overabundance of energy that could manifest itself in some anxious behaviors. She could start trembling or drooling for reasons that were not apparent to me. Or if she was alone when one of these things came on for her, then she could get destructive in the house. Now, my initial attempts to work with her with training and just exercise, jogging, playing fetch, those types of things, did not have the effect that I was looking for with her anxious behaviors. Then she started to do agility, which is negotiating a course of obstacles with a person. You may have seen it on TV, the teeter-totter and tunnel and jump and weave pole. But I noticed that when she started to work through agility, work with a person in the human canine bond and have to think about the, the obstacles and be mentally stimulated, I saw a marked difference in her behavior. That one hour of agility was worth 36 hours of calm for her, at least. And so I started to think of her and with me and with the other dogs that I was working with, that anxiety was a fire that needed fuel to burn. And if we could find a way to burn that fuel other than to be anxious, then we could lower some of the symptoms and start to make headway in other areas. And I also noticed with that combination of mental stimulation that you can't just run it out of us. So I coined the phrase brain calories versus body calories. And so I started planning the dog's activities and my activities uh, kind of according to that to make sure that we stayed mentally engaged. So sometimes shelter dogs don't get a chance to burn body calories or brain calories. And this can start to manifest in anxious behaviors, uh, repetitive, obsessive. When it reaches this point, the slang is kennel crazy. It comes from just feeling trapped, 
um, stressed in the environment, frustrated, unable to find release, and unable to find calm. But when I see these dogs, I don't just see a dog trapped in a cage. I see my mind trapped in an anxiety attack, ruminating back and forth and unable to find release and unable to find calm. My mind can get in these states and it can last for days. It's unrelenting. And it's always the worst at night. When the world shuts down and gets quiet and your brain won't, the volume and the intensity seems exponentially louder. I call it the nightmare hour, like 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. It can be a lot to deal with. So one day after, after having an evening like this, I was at work, I was in a dog pack, and I had a moment. It was 70 degrees out, we were all facing the same direction, the sun was shining on us and our ears were blowing in the wind. <laughs> and I realized that my mind was quiet. And for all the work that I had done with those dogs, I felt truly grateful to them for sharing that with me. And I stopped thinking of them in terms of handler and pet or charge and steward. And I started to think of them as partners in this journey that we were taking and, and felt a more symbiotic connection with them. And I wanted to learn about that moment, how, when, where, why, how can I replicate this and how can I share this with people? Now I wanna pause here. In the years since then, I've done a lot of reading and learning and research uh, from a lot of brilliant people. In the interest of actually getting to my idea, I'm gonna blast through what I've taken from them and, and from what I've, I've got with it. But there's some very intelligent and brilliant people doing great work, and so if this interests you, please take a picture of the slide or email me or something and look it up. Dogs did domesticate with us tens of thousands of years ago. And they did benefit from that with such things as food availability, companionship, that type of thing. But this is not a story of dogs riding our coattails through evolution. They very much help us as well. They were able to lend us their senses. They helped us sound the alarm at our camps, protect ourselves, protect our food stores. They made the bow and arrow a viable hunting tool because they could help us track all of these skills developed over this time of us being a partnership. And because of this, we developed some very unique ways of communicating with dogs and, and a cross-species emotional literacy. When we look at each other, we subconsciously look at the right side of the person's face, my left, so we call it left side bias. Because with the right side of our face, we most truly express the emotion that we're feeling at that time. Dogs also do that when they look at people. They don't do that when they look at each other, and no other animal shares that with us. That's unique to us. When we vocalize, dogs, their brain goes off and they can tell what emotional state we're in, and we can tell what dogs want through their vocalizations. We can tell from looking at each other, body language, signs. When we bond and, and spend time with dogs, our brains go through the same physiological process that we do with babies and children. And all of this stuff developed over a long period of us working together in a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Now, as we hit the industrial age, two things happened that caused a fundamental shift in the human-canine bond. Technology made our lives so much easier that we just didn't have to work as hard to survive, and neither did our canine companions. And because we weren't working as much, we had more spare time and for the first time, we saw a clear delineation between pet dogs and working dogs as hobby breeding came into vogue and we started picking dogs for fashion over function. And as we move into the modern age today, we see the seeds of those lifestyle changes in the, the current ways that we struggle uh, with depression and stress and anxiety and with the pet dynamic that we have with our dogs, where people that maintain a working relationship with their dogs is actually a small minority. Dr. Stephen Olardi said that depression is a disease of civilization, that we're not built to live as we do today, physically or mentally. Neither are our canine companions. As we become aware of what we face today and how we can mitigate and deal with those issues, we need to be aware of that in our canine companions as well. 
we evolve together, we can hit these bumps together, and we can heal together. Now, dogs do help people now. We do this in the animal-assisted therapy model. So when a person with a specific need is paired with a dog that's specially trained or purposed to get a specific outcome, these would be your service dog, therapy dog, emotional support dog, uh, like my dog Leonidas. When he was a puppy, he was abused, and we took him in and loved him. We really didn't have to do a lot of work with him. He's just a great little dude. Uh, but now he is a trauma survivor. Uh, he's an adult, doesn't act like one. But uh, he's a registered therapy dog, and we go and visit the VA in the animal-assisted therapy model. These dogs are, are like bomb-sniffing dogs or police dogs. They're specially trained to do what they do. They're like tools, like wheelchair, walker. They're meant to help a person that, that needs that help. Now, they're clearly more than that in practice. Anybody that's ever been paired with a service dog or with a therapy dog will tell you that, that there's something more there. The human canine bond is still amazing even in that circumstance. But that's an auxiliary benefit to the intended purpose of that dog. We don't need specially trained dogs to reap the benefits of the human canine bond. And we can't fully realize that bond if we don't look to our symbiotic past to see what it was in its, in its original state. Because we are mammals, we have similar physiology and behaviors, which means that we experience stress and anxiety and trauma and manifest those symptoms similarly. Because we evolved together, we have uh, the same needs and the same challenges that face us in modern society, but our unique relationship and our ability to communicate with each other creates some amazing parallels and opportunities for healing. An exciting place for research to look in the future would be to augment and grow from the animal-assisted therapy model into the symbiotic model of human and canine healing, where instead of pairing a person in need with a specially trained dog, we pair a person in need with a dog in need, and they work in a mutually therapeutic environment towards a goal of mutual healing. Now, within the mutual healing, we have all of it as evidence-based to help and, and increase likelihoods of positive outcomes in therapeutic environment. We would have guided clinical work, so it would be with a counselor or on the dog side with a trainer. And then we have lifestyle choices and activities that we can make that also help us on that therapeutic journey. And all of this stuff works for dogs and people. And what this looks like in application is parallel and converging paths. If we have the same challenges and the same solutions, then why would we go separately when we're stronger together? You would see that, for example, a dog and a person would need to be assessed by a counselor or a trainer, respectively, and they would have individual stuff that they want to work on. In PTSD, treatments like behavioral uh, cognitive therapy or exposure therapy are similar to things that we would do with dogs that are experiencing the similar symptoms, like reconditioning and desensitization training. Those two can interact and be with each other through that journey. They also benefit from being in social settings. People go to a trauma group or they need support groups, and dogs need time and packs to get social cues and to try and find an even space again. But all those can be integrated through that process, so again, it works in the human-canine bond. Diet becomes important to people and dogs in this process. It affects the chemistry in our brain as we try and, and move through these. And exercise actually presents some exciting options where we don't have to run through the savanna and hunt large game together, but we can find activities to do, dog sports, agility like I mentioned before, weight pulling, dock diving, any number of things where we have to learn to communicate with each other, facilitate a relationship, and accomplish goals together while being physically active, all within the, this therapeutic environment. And then we can't be working all the time. We still need social time. We need the support of our friends and family and loved ones, packs, dogs, and humans. We can work together in all of this. So as we work on ourselves, we also help a dog, which is nice. It puts us in a mutually therapeutic environment that returns us to our natural state as working partners. And then a dog can provide external motivation for a person. It can give them a sense of purpose and a way to get personally invested in the therapeutic process. And the physical movement involved with caring for a dog and interacting with a dog, all of those things are known to increase the likelihood of positive outcomes in therapy. And then both the dog and the person actively participate in their own and each other's therapy. 
Now there is logistical challenges to executing a mental health model with dog packs, <laughs> but it can be done. I partnered with Jill Reese, who's a licensed clinical social worker, and we created Peace with Packs. It's a mindfulness class that we teach intermixed with shelter dogs. And we can teach mindfulness techniques to people, and we can interact with the dogs in a way that is relaxing for them and gives them an opportunity to bond with people outside of the containment of the shelter environment. And in that way, they both can learn to find calm moments together, and they can learn to be present. We've had so much fun visiting the VA and met so many amazing people that some of the staff there started to engage me about what would the logistics look like <clears throat> for us to move from the animal-assisted model to the more actively engaging symbiotic model. <clears throat> like, for instance, substituting Peace with Pax in for their normal mindfulness class. And then we all have the opportunity to do this with our own dogs at home. We have our own journeys and our own things that we need to do and issues we need to deal with, and statistically, at least half of you have dogs. So we can still explore these options and learn about the ways that we can do these things with our dogs and kind of expand from being pets to being partners. Like my friend Taylor, he was an army uh, scout. He was deployed in Iraq. And when he came back, we became very good friends and he started working with me in the dogs and exploring some of these symbiotic ideas. The bond between the dog and its owner is, it just reminds me of being in the army, uh, me and one of my buddies, somebody that I've only known for a few months but no matter what, I know he's gonna lay his life down on the line for me and I'll gladly do the same for him. The way that the interaction is with the dog that I'm fostering, he would do anything for me and now I know I would do anything for him. I don't think I expected that kind of relationship when I initially said I was gonna foster dogs and you know help you out with that. I thought I was just gonna feed them, put them to bed and that'd be it. I didn't expect that kind of bond uh, to feel that again um, without actually being back in the military. Now, sadly, there is a high demand for both of these things. There's a lot of dogs that are euthanized every year, and a good chunk of those are for behavior reasons, and a lot of dogs are abused every year. And because of the running conflicts that we've had, there's a whole generation of veterans coming back that are trying to readjust to home and find calm. And as they go through that process and they bring attention to those things, it makes it okay for older veterans to come forward who had never got help before. And it makes it okay for civilians who experience those things for different reasons to come forward. It makes mental health more acceptable in society. So it's just in the last few years that we have started to see what happens in an active canine brain when they interact with a person. And as we learn more about our past together and our bond and our relationship and the potential for our future. It's my hope that we can create more spaces and more environments and more opportunities to explore the symbiotic model of healing so we can help people and dogs, not just to get better, but to overall be healthier. Thank you.